everyone and welcome back to another True Potential Do More With Your Money podcast. So with a US and a UK general election coming up over the next 12 months, we thought today we would have a look at how politics affects your investments and uh, it definitely does. We're going to discuss how with Paul, with Craig and Neil Rayner uh, joining us on this week's True Potential podcast. Do you want to open it up first of all then? I'll come to you, uh, Paul, if I can, first of all. Uh, maybe just give us a sense of the extent to which politics does affect investments. We'll get into some of the specifics of, as I say, the elections and we'll look at recent history uh, in due course. But for now, just what is the connection between political events and people's investments? Is it a strong connection? Yes, it is. Um, it, every case is, is different. And really what markets like is stability, predictability. And often in politics, politics that's not the case. Um, it depends on the event. So when you have a US election, it depends on the candidates, what's their um, thoughts around regulation, taxes, government spending, to what extent, you know, how much spending are they going to do and what does that mean for the amount of debt that governments have? Can they finance that debt? Is it sustainable? Um, so, and that feeds into businesses, Corporate tax rates go up or down, it impacts profitability. Individuals, taxes coming down, boost their disposable incomes. And so that filters into economic growth and ultimately corporate profitability and markets uh, will play into that. It's usually these events are coming to focus for a short period of time, but then they move on. And would you say the, the greatest effects you see are, are political decisions that affect the corporate world. So when they're raising business taxes, which affects obviously business profitability, is that, is that if you like, where we see most effect on people's investments? Or would, for example, a policy around, you know, we've heard this week uh, about things like banning smoking for, for, you know, in future and, and, and investment in transport infrastructure, things, do those kind of what I would call retail policy, things that affect all of us versus say businesses, is there one side that affects investments more or is it is it fairly evenly spread? I suppose there's a, a, direct, a direct impact on, on corporates when you change the tax rates. You know, profitability will change and depending on the levels, mm. very much depends on whether a company is fairly valued or not and what the price uh, or what the market thinks of that. But it's all interconnected mm. and it's difficult to say with, you know, you know it's very much case by case and it depends on the details. Really. Yeah, that's interesting because when people, you know, when you have a budget, and we're going to be having one of those um, uh, just later on this month, and, and perhaps when there are political events, people think more in terms of how it affects them directly, um, in terms of their own personal tax and things like this. But perhaps, as as Paul's saying, there's a where, where maybe we should be looking is what it's doing in the bit to the business world, because of course that affects share prices and things like this. But Craig, is it? Do you, have you found in recent years you've had more contact with clients, or uh, when there's been? things happening politically, which has been a lot lately? Yeah, they're, they're directly linked. I think if, if you look back, you know, the, the most vo the volatile kind of scenario I can think of, certainly in the last 18 months, is probably from the, the, the mini budget they did at the end of last year. Mm. You know, that caused uh, a lot of a lot of volatility in the market, but also uncertainty, as, as, as what Paul said. I think if you look towards the spring budget this year, uh, a lot of changes, um, particularly in relation to pensions, which I'm sure I will discuss, but a lot of those changes affect products, they affect tax, they affect allowances, which in turn affects clients in the suitability of those arrangements that they might have or already had, but also any prospective investment as well. And the kind of two sides sort of thing, as Paul mentioned, there's markets, there's volatility, but actually personal tax, that affects mm -hmm. individuals' ability to save and, and, and put money away and invest. But importantly, the actual suitability of the products they hold can be affected at the same time. So mm -hmm. definitely this kind of year, you know, budgets are coming out, there's things that we need to be conscious of because um, it will affect investors at the end of the day. Yeah. Well, well, Craig's just mentioned there, Neil, the, the pension uh, lifetime allowance changes. There were some other changes, annual allowances. Just first of all, remind us what they were earlier this year, what the changes were, and then maybe talk, if you will, about just how that affects people's maybe investment strategies. Yeah, well, you know, obviously the, the big change was the lifetime allowance, obviously the, the, the abolishment and obviously the annual allowance went up from um, 40 to 60,000 uh, uh, some months ago that obviously affected um, the ability for clients to to um, invest into those particular products and like Craig said um, it, it affects clients personally because it affects how much money they can save into um, certain products like pensions um, there's always been muted changes for to increase the ISA allowance uh, which you know would be great for for clients 
Um, but yeah, I mean, conversations normally around budgets and normally around when tax legislation changes, we get a rise in calls from clients because they want to know how it affects those, um, how it affects their saving, and also more importantly, with us being goals-based, mm -hmm. how it affects their individual retirement goals. Yeah. I, think, I think a good point with Neil talked about there, it's not always negative when we're yeah. changing. Like you talk yeah. about positive changes, particularly in relation to pensions, as we're referring to, the re removal of the LTA, the lifetime allowance tax charge, um, the increase in the allowances, not only to the annual allowance, but the money purchase annual allowance, for example. It gives clients opportunity and opportunity to invest more and, and close the savings gap. So mm -hmm. it's not always a negative thing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, changes to taxes in this, in this scenario, to talk about pensions, is a real positive change that's going to benefit you know, many a client and already has. Yeah. Well, it's, it's not that long ago. Uh, 2015, I think it was, when pension freedoms came in, totally uh, changed the landscape of, of what you can do with a pension and, and how you can access your money. We've also had in that in that period as well changes to, well, actually going back to since 2010, we've had changes to the personal allowance, how much you can earn tax-free, ISA allowances, which I think were about £6,000. Uh, they're now up to 20000 So some big, big changes that have obviously as a result of political uh, decisions. So the, and, and you tend to get those around budget time. Um, so we know we'll be looking closely at what happens in a couple of weeks' time. I just want to go back, if I can, to you though, Paul, because the last, well, I was going to say the last four years, really, it's, you've probably got to go back to 2016 and, and the Brexit uh, sort of vote and things that have happened since then with Trump in the UK. We've had, yeah, you know, we're on to, I mean, how many prime ministers, is that like four or five prime ministers since Brexit? Um, and, uh, you know, COVID, all the rest of it as well. So, I mean, there's been an awful lot of change. What particularly stands out for you over that period as being the biggest market mover? I would say typically during a political event where you find the most volatility is within currencies. So if we go back to the Brexit referendum, you saw sterling fall 10, 15% in a very short space of time. You go back to Liz Trust last year, what do you see? You see sterling fall 10% because the markets have less confidence in the UK government mm. and the UK economic outlook. And so the best way to reflect that is through the value of the, of the pound. And you t typically see that in emerging markets, in developed markets as well. And I suppose when we think about our portfolios, we try and mitigate some of that volatility by hedging our currencies back to sterling to help dampen volatility and, and mitigate some of uh, the political and noise and volatility that comes through in these events. But it very much depends on the um, political events. So if we think about Donald Trump in 2016, 2017, coming into the results of whether Trump would win, when it looked like Trump was going to win, markets fell 5% in the day, but actually finished up 1% by the end of the day. So you can get these moments of very sharp volatility and it can make people nervous. Typically the best things to do is just wait, sit in your hands, yeah. watch it, let the dust settle, have confidence in the investment proposition that you're in. Mm. Being in a very diversified solution is often <coughs> beneficial because it helps smooth the ride for, for, for clients, for investors, and you know, active management really does pay in that scenario. Given some of the events that we've had over the last six years, you've mentioned some of them there, and then you, you look at the previous, well, six, ten, however many years, relative calm compared to what we've had in a fairly short space of time. So have markets become a bit desensitised to some of this stuff, do you think? I mean, you know, as I say, at the time of Brexit, you mentioned it there, big, big, you know, big swings and, and drops and back up again and all the rest of it. But we've just had so much around the world, actually, not just in the UK, but, but particularly I'm thinking of here. Is there a sense of, actually, we can take a lot of this more in our stride now, or, or have you not seen that? I think, you know, Markets will always get fearful at the extremes, and um, you know when you see a big change in a candidate, whether it's Donald Trump, you know Liz Truss, um, whether there's you know, Joe Biden and his big fiscal sp spending plans. You know when things change materially, then the market really focuses on it. Um, I would also say that. We are global investors, so whether there's a situation in the UK with Liz Truss or, or whoever, we may be focused on that, but the global community may not be. 
you know, the UK economy is only, I think it's like the sixth largest or seventh largest in the world, important, but nowhere near as important as the US or is in China. If we look at world equities, UK equities is only around four, five percent of that composition. So, yeah. And I guess that's the value of a diversified portfolio that you look after, which is that it's not, we're not, we're eggs aren't all in one basket. So if you do have some political chaos in one area or another of the world, that's, you know, you, there are other areas where there'll be opportunities being created and you'll be in those as well. Exactly. And that's, you know, often, um, you know, clients may say, well, I'm invested in the FTSE 100. Look how the FTSE 100 is done. Well, that may, may be so, but it's, you know, you create, you're exposed to very idiosyncratic risks relevant to that market, whereas by being diversified, you're less exposed to those risks uh, and uh, um, there is real benefits <coughs> to it. Yeah, I think the American market over the past week or two has obviously been shown growth in, within the portfolios and uh, mentioned that the diversified aspect of the portfolio allows Paul and his team to, to make any changes, like you said, on a, a quick basis within the portfolios and increase or decrease exposure to certain markets, which has been really helpful being in that type of portfolio um, and has certainly helped in the last week as well. Last week has been fantastic. You know, UK markets perhaps struggled a bit, the FTSE 100, but if you look at not only the US, but Japan, China, emerging markets, they've been fantastic over Why? the last. Why? Well, there's a sense that interest rates in the US have peaked. So interest rates no longer going up is a good thing because it means that the interest burden on corporations when they're financing debt, mortgages going up, less so. So if that's peaked, then the next direction mm. should be down. Mm -hmm. And lower interest rates is a real benefit. Um, and you've seen a little bit of data over the last week where it's more, it's not terrible. The, it's showing that the economic um, activity is moderating and you're seeing some rebalancing within the US labor market, which means that inflation is likely to be less sticky or be able to come continue to fall, meaning that interest rates can also in the future begin to fall. And that's what's expected next year. Market got confident, uh, gained confidence on that last week. And markets just, mm. well, it didn't use sentiment as well, got quite downbeat. Mm -hmm. And it just shows you the power, you know, almost remaining invested because markets can quickly turn mm -hmm. in a week and you can miss out on five, six percent returns in a very short space yeah. time. So bring Craig on at that point and just what are you, what are you hearing from clients and advisors at the minute as well? What are they think, what are they thinking about? Yeah I think certainly prior to, to last week it was you know of a lot of volatility as, as Paul mentioned, a lot of things going on in the world which ties into volatility which makes noise and it feeds into markets and that in turn feeds into clients wealth and portfolios so it's understandable that clients are going to call and be concerned because of that because you know they're seeing their, their figures their, their numbers and their performance and their funds uh, maybe not being what they want it to be um, but you know if you just take this week as, as Paul and Neil mentioned how quickly that can turn and you know we were reiterating a number of times on the podcast about you know staying in the markets sitting on your hands and really when times are tough it's actually the time to do nothing and I think this is just a an example albeit a short-term example of how quickly things can turn around and, and be beneficial so actually we've got clients booked in on performance calls that are calling up this week and the conversations that we're having with them now is actually if you if you log in and look at your app now you'll see that the upturn <coughs> in the performance yeah. of what you've had and it so does change that quick I, you know you might have a client who's booked in for a week's time to talk about a certain level of performance and how the portfolio is performing mm -hmm. by the time you have that call they made really a lot of increased gains within the portfolio, especially over the last week. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's a different conversation that you're having then because you're thinking, oh, wow, it's been a really positive week. But it really emphasises the fact that staying invested, mm -hmm. you know, you're going to get those gains. Yeah. I, th I think, you know, just bringing it back to the political element, you know, we'll always have elections. Every country will have elections throughout time. And we all have always had them. And it's just a short time period where the markets will focus on and then it'll move on yeah. and the next thing will come up and then it'll move on. And, 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 and also, you know, being as, as we all are clients of true potential, part of the, of the, um, the service that you get is that I don't have to worry about 
what's it doing today? What am I to do tomorrow? Because I pay you to do that. You get to look after my portfolio and you, you, you're looking for the opportunities over the long term. I, want, I don't want to be, I want to be able to watch the news so I know what's going on. But I, know, I want to know that I can just you know, sit tight and, and relax and let you look after it. And of course, those of us who work with you and your team know that that's what you do every day is look for the opportunities around the world and that's what you, that's what you get paid to do. Uh, and you're the expert, so well, we should leave them too. Well, when the markets are nervous, which they have been, you know, you know, constantly at some point, and they are, can get quite volatile, you wouldn't want to manage that yourself. You'd want a managed portfolio yeah. where there are investment professionals looking after your money. Exactly, and finding the opportunities around the world. And you know, you've talked on these podcasts before, Paul, and your team about the, you know, how you can change the the dynamics in a portfolio, and a bit less of this, and a bit more of that. And you're there taking advantage of. I mean, I always think the volatility has a, a negative connotation, but actually it's your friend, isn't it? Because it's where you find the opportunities for growth. You know, if you had a flat, like a flat market the entire time, there'd be no growth. You need ups and downs, is that right? Is it, you know, without volatility, we wouldn't have, I wouldn't have a job. You know, if, if markets just did friend, that, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, you need a market, you need people taking different views, and, you know, when, times, when prices fall, that's often the best opportunities to get in. Mm. Uh, when markets are expensive, okay, you might want to take some money away and go into a, a different market. But the beauty, really, of our proposition is uh, we're globally invested and we've got many different asset classes that we can invest in or are invested in. And we've just got different levers to pull, mm-hmm. you know, whether that's currency, um, equities, alternative assets, or which now coming more into focus is fixed income, which has had a tough two years, which if you looked back at the data, you think, oh, I want to stay away from that. But actually now it's looking really interesting. Yeah. Right. Speaking of volatility, um, Donald Trump, um, would, it, would it be fair to say there was a, a little bit of volatility last time he was in the White House? Because if you look at the polling in the, in the States, and I was looking at this just yesterday, in, in I think six of the key swing states in the US, he's leading Joe Biden in five of them. Yeah. And in some cases, by almost double-digit points. And you think, well, okay, you know, that's not, that should be taken with a little bit of a pinch of salt at this stage because we're a year out, uh, just, just a year out now from uh, the US election. But, I mean, you know, <laughs> the bottom line is, he is the front-running Republican candidate. It looks like he's going to go head-to-head with Joe Biden. He's ahead in some of the swing states. We could be coming back for a, a Trump 2.0. So what happened last time in terms of markets? Well, markets uh, very much enjoyed... Well, he claims he was good for markets. I mean, you tell he, us. Well, he cut tax rates and he cut corporate tax rates significantly. Um, I think the tax bills that he put through, or the tax cuts that he put through, were the largest in, I'll probably get this wrong, but over 30 years. Um, so that's positive for markets. Markets did well. Uh, this time round, not quite sure, um, because the challenge the US has is its government debt is huge. And the um, problem with that is they can't just keep expanding their debt pile. They've got to get that debt down. The other way they get that debt down is by taxing people more yeah. Yeah. and spending less, um, which is not what Donald Trump did last time. So it's going to be a really interesting one in terms of over the next 12 months. What's the edge, Trump uh, and Biden? What they go, What is it going to be? Because it's can't promise loads of tax cuts. We mm. can't promise loads of spending. Um, yeah. So what's the edge? Uh, be? Well, and, sure. and we'll see the same in the UK, of course, because there, the, there's going to be a general election next year. We don't know when. Um, it's not like in the US where there's a fixed. Well, there is. It is like in the US now. There has to be a certain. Has to be by a certain point. Um, but the actual date we don't know yet. Um, although the betting seems to be around about September, October time next year. We have many of the same economic difficulties that you've just mentioned in the UK. Hence. Partly, hence why, in the, the King speech this week, there were no big economic announcements. I mean, that wasn't what was there. It was things like, uh, you know, a ban on smoking and things like that. But there were, there were no big... We'll, we'll see some of that come through in the budget. Of course, there'll be one more budget uh, in the spring next year, which I guess will be the election one. Um, but we have... Whoever wins the UK election, and it looks like where the US might be going to take a, a move to the right, it, the polling seems to say in the UK we're going to be taking a move to the left. But... We're going to have some, whoever comes, whoever's in power in the UK this time next year is going to have some of the same issues you're just talking about. Is that right? Absolutely. Same problem. Loads of debt. 100% of uh, 
GDP or the ratio of debt to GDP is over 100%, similar as in the US. The interest expense or payments that the government has to pay each month, uh, each 12 months is over 100 billion. So that's 1% of GDP. Um, just to service the debt. Just to service the debt. Yeah. Just to keep flat. So the interest on the, the national credit card, as it were, is probably bigger than the school's budget, the police budget, and exactly. goodness knows what else added together. And now the problem mad, the, the, the UK has faced is that a lot of their debt, I think it's around a quarter of their debt, is linked to inflation. And because inflation has been going up, their interest rate payments have had to go up. Um, so not expecting many giveaways in the autumn statement in mm. November. Yeah. So what is then the message to, to clients and people watching this thinking, OK, I get it, there's a lot coming up over the next year? Yeah, I think, I think it ties in directly, as we've mentioned at the start there. Again, the, the rhetoric from, from ourselves being, you know, we put you in the right product from an advice perspective. Paul, Chris and the team look after the money um, and make sure that the, the money's working for you as, as best as we can. You know, the rhetoric is, is consistent that, you know, keep invested, remain. They look for opportunity as, as we've seen this week and, and you know, it's going to be a volatile period as, as it, in, in any election or a change of government, but, you know, have confidence in the proposition and, and, and stay where you are and, and your long term generally prevails for most people. Um, from an advice perspective, when we're talking about products, Again, the suitability of those products are probably something which you can review with your advisor. So if tax ranges change, if ISA allowances go up, if inheritance tax thresholds potentially changes, is being talked about by ministers, there's, there's scope and opportunity within that. So if you are uncertain, you know, how maybe tax changes affect you, get in touch with the advisor. They're there to ensure the suitability of your investment from a product perspective mm -hmm. is consistent. So that's kind of the message which I would leave with. Yeah, I would also say as well, you know, Craig has a good point, but... Um, think of the products that you're invested in and think of the long term mm -hmm. because although capital gains tax is decreasing, pension allowances are going up. So think about the products that you have and have a chat with your advisor yeah. and feel what works right for you in your personal circumstances and how much money you've got to put in and what's your long term financial goals. Tax will change undoubtedly, it always has done and you know limits have changed. Um, that might mean that you're not better off investing there, you're better off investing here. Mm -hmm. So having a chat with the advisor about where you're currently invested. And like Craig said, stay invested. Um, this short-term volatility in the grand scheme of things, if we looked at the past two, three years, it's not a great long, it's not a, gr it's not a long time in the, in the scheme of your retirement, your pension, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and, and the point worth make, making is that even throughout all that volatility, going back to 2016 and Brexit, markets are higher. You know, we've had, of course you've had in-year volatility, but markets over that period of time have grown. Uh, and that's a message that doesn't always get picked up when you're watching the TV or listening to the radio, reading newspapers, that actually yep. there's been, for all that, that's gone on, and of course it's in the media's interest to, to dr dramatise and make it all seem like it's uh, even more crazy than perhaps it really is, but markets have continued to grow, and um, so have you if you've stayed invested, I guess. Good final point to end on then, Neil, with us. Or speak to your advisor. It is always the best advice we can give, which is pick up the phone, drop a message through. Get in touch with us here, Neil's team, they're here for you. Um, you can drop us a line. Uh, through the app, through the website, you can pick up the phone and come and see us, get in touch with us and we can always uh, give you our best advice, which is what we would do. Another good tip is to subscribe and tune into these podcasts and of course our other content that you'll find on this channel because it's designed to help you and cut through some of the um, nonsense and other stuff you might read or hear about online and just give it to you straight, so that's what we do here. But for now, thank you Neil, thanks Craig and Paul as well and thank you for listening and we'll see you next time. Bye for now.